Planet Earth. It'll be a day long symposium on um, how astronomers can participate in the dialogue and discourse around the climate crisis through education, stewardship, activism, and um, so on. And tonight I'm absolutely thrilled, by the way, I should introduce myself. My name is Linda Shore. I'm the chief executive officer of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific in San Francisco, where we work on the borrowed lands of the Ooni. And let me introduce our special speaker. And first, before I do that, I should say that joining us, um, we have astronomers from all over the world actually, that are joining us interested in the issue of the climate crisis, as well as hundreds and thousands and billions of you that are watching right now on our YouTube live stream. So welcome YouTubers. So let me introduce our special speaker. Jill Tarter is the Emeritus Chair of the SETI Research um, at the SETI Institute in Mountain View. She serves as a member of their board of trustees as well. She received her Bachelor of Engineering Physics degree with distinction from Cornell University and a master's degree and PhD in astronomy from the University of California, Berkeley. She spent most of her professional career attempting to the ans answer the question, are we alone? By searching for evidence of technologically advanced civilizations beyond the earth. She served as project scientist for NASA SETI, the high resolution microwave survey and has conducted numerous observational programs at radio observatories around the world. She's a fellow of the AAAS, the California Academy of Sciences, and the Explorers Club. She was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World in 2004, and one of Time Magazine's 25 in Space in 2012. She received a TED Prize in 2009, two public service awards from NASA, and multiple awards for communicating science to the public. And it is with enormous pleasure and pride that I introduce Jill Tarter to you. Hi, Jill. Hi, Linda. Thank you very much for that very nice introduction. And let's assume that screen management is now all set up and I can share my screen with you. Well, we have to figure out which of the screens I'm going to share. So it's this one. And I peer around the edge of my laptop and... Perfect. Great. All right. So... Um, I'm going to talk to you about some of the reasons that I think looking for life um, beyond Earth is um, really important to life here on Earth. So let me start by, I didn't know that Linda was going to do such a wonderful in um, introduction, so I thought I would um, introduce myself. So uh, I work with a team that uses radio telescopes to try and find extraterrestrial technologies. Um, I'm the one that is not wearing headphones. Uh, as Linda told you, I have degrees from Cornell and Berkeley. Um, I've done a number of jobs, but they've all revolved around this question of trying to find life beyond Earth, in particular, technological life. And so although I am officially retired, I still spend my time cheerleading for all things SETI. So um, before we talk about finding them, I'd actually like to put us into context, right? So where are we and when are we? Well, where am I? I'm here, you're there. And it, for most of us, it's uh, sitting at home and working from home for uh, low these many months. And in my case, that uh, is in this house here in the Berkeley Hills, in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, on the west coast of the United States. And ever since 1968, we've been able to understand um, from Bill Anders' beautiful Earthwise photograph that we're here on a singular planet floating in the darkness of space. And this has really become an emblem for the environmental movements that have been um, growing over the decades. And actually, if you got the memo back in 2013 and put on some clean clothes and went out on the lawn and waved, 
um, you could have seen yourself in this selfie because at the end of that arrow, there actually is a little white dot. And that's Earth as seen from the Cassini spacecraft. That's all of us. And prior to that, long time before, 1990, as the Voyager 1 spacecraft was passing um, by Neptune on its way out of the solar system, it turned around and captured us here, this pale blue dot in a beam of sunlight and dust. And we're here, right? In a grand spiral galaxy with a few hundred billion stars. And until now, what I've shown you are actual images of what I'm telling you they are. This is not, however, an image of the Milky Way because we don't have a way of getting outside the galaxy to be able to turn around and take a picture of our home world. This is M101 and it's what we thought the galaxy structure would look like. But this is invisible light. And we now have been able to map our galaxy from the inside out using radio waves and looking at various gases and dust emission from the Milky Way. And so we can see that this is the actual structure that we've mapped. It's pretty close to M101, except that we have a much bigger bar. And we are here. And our sun is only one of hundreds of billions of stars. And indeed, our Milky Way galaxy is only one of hundreds of billions of galaxies in the observable universe. And we can see this beautiful uh, image from the Hubble Deep Field. And if you stare at this, you notice that some of those points of light are smaller and fainter than others. And that's because they're farther away. And so as we look farther from us, we're looking farther back in time, which means that we have to say, where, when are we? And so we're now, and um, that's 13.8 um, billion years after the Big Bang. And we're in an epoch, an era of galaxies and stars and planets. And this is essentially a scientific creation myth. It is extremely well supported with data and observations. And we do a very good job at reproducing the um, cosmogony of our cosmos until we get back to the earliest times and the most energetic of um, situations. Because at the earliest times, we still can't make um, gravity, <coughs> excuse me, we still can't uh, make gravity and um, energy play well together. So this is a scientific creation myth based on observations of essentially 4% of the matter energy density in our universe. And we today talk about dark energy and dark matter, and we don't know what they are. Dark is just a key word for we haven't figured it out yet, but there are many, many cosmologists working on this problem to try and understand better this picture, particularly in the earliest moments of time. And it's important to think about this context because we humans are intimately connected with events that are far away and long ago. So we humans track and trace our lineage, not just back through the centuries of our families, and not just back through the millennia of our art and architecture and our various experiments with different types of governance, not just back through the millions of years since we branched off from the great apes, and not just back 
the 2.4 billion years since the Earth's atmosphere has been perfused with oxygen, thanks to the labors of photosynthetic bacteria. And not just that, some 4.6 billion years ago to the formation of our solar system, we actually, humans trace our lineage back millions of years before this, back to a giant molecular cloud, which was polluted with the remnants of earlier stars that blew up in supernova explosion, leaving behind a remnant like this modern one. And it was also polluted with the winds of Wolf Rayet stars. And that cloud would then condense to form the solar system and the planets and us. And the reason that we need to trace our lineage all the way back here is because everything that's heavier than hydrogen and helium, all the stuff that makes you, you and me, me, was formed in the cores of massive stars that exploded and seeded the medium um, billions of years ago. Or there are certain elements that required the collisions of um, neutron stars to produce them. But all the stuff that we're made of came from here. And we are intimately connected with that. So 400 years of astronomy um, teaches us that it really does take a cosmos to make a human. And uh, a lot of this study comes under the umbrella of a relatively new science called astrobiology, right? And it's, it's trying to find inhabited worlds through the deliberate or consequential actions of the inhabitants. So under this umbrella, we have two disciplines, looking for biosignatures and looking for technosignatures. And so looking for life beyond Earth, there are a number of things that we could do. We could discover it. We could find in situ biomarkers. We might find artifacts in our own solar system or we can try to make remote observations of biosignatures in exoplanets around other stars. So this question of biosignatures is one of trying to get the measurement capability to look at the faint planets that orbit close to, spatially close to very bright stars and look for disequilibrium chemistry in the atmospheres, sort of like what happens in Earth's atmosphere where you have the coexistence of molecular methane and oxygen. And those are very reactive gases. And when they come together, they turn into water vapor and carbon dioxide. And that's happening in our atmosphere all the time. But we have such strong biological source functions on the planet we have bovine flatulence to give us methane and we have photosynthesis to give us oxygen, that we have detectable amounts of these gases out of equilibrium in the atmosphere. And we're hoping that we could perhaps find something like this if we get the technology to image and make spectra of the atmospheres of distant exoplanets. And you know, it's not going to be easy and it may be a bit ambiguous. We've recently been telling ourselves a bit of a story about perhaps life in the Venetian, Venusian clouds, right? There has been the claim of the detection of phosphine gas in those clouds. And it's controversial because first of all, it's only a single line um, detection. And usually we like to have lots of different molecular lines to identify a particular component. And uh, the claim is made that we've gone through the entire litany of chemical paths that could create phosphine gas, and we can't produce it in the amounts that were claimed in the detection paper. And we note that on Earth, where phosphine is found and produced, 
it's in anaerobic uh, locations and it requires biology as part of the process. So this has been tantalizing for a while, but then sigh. Um, it's now with additional work been shown that the line identification is probably incorrect. It's probably SO2 and not phosphine gas. So this ambiguity is happening in our closest neighbor. And it can only be much worse when we talk about distant exoplanets whose history and context we have very little knowledge about. So another current example is the claim that we're seeing methane gas coming out of the, um, the cracks in the uh, icy shell of Enceladus. And it makes us think about the hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the Earth's oceans where you have these gases being produced and very, very um, diverse biospheres around those black smokers. So it's ambiguous. This is gonna be hard to settle, right? It might be less ambiguous if indeed you were not looking for biosignatures, but you went looking for technosignatures. <clears throat> so here you're trying to detect the work product of life, either technosignatures of some kind or perhaps just some serendipitous observation of huge, vast astroengineering um, projects. So technosignatures are what we have been looking for at the SETI Institute um, for a long time. And they, if you're thinking about electromagnetic signals as an indication of a technosignature, a technological civilization, then there are two kinds of deliberate signals. You could find signals that are almost natural, that you would stumble across in the pursuit of your astronomical observations, or you could find signals that were obviously engineered. So some examples of almost natural signals are, for example, a pulsar, all right? Rotating neutron star, very precise clock. Occasionally, there's a star quake and the pulsar changes its period. But we've never found a pulsar that went from one period to a second period and then back to the first. They would show up in our pulsar searches and some graduate student might scratch their head when they were looking at the data and say, what is this? It could be a technosignature. All right, here's another example. We find exoplanets because of transits. The planet casting a shadow on the surface of its star as it moves across. Now, the IAU tells us that planets by definition have to be spherical, so their shadows will be round. But if you looked at the higher uh, order moments of light curves during ingress and egress, there is enough information in those higher order moments to distinguish a shadow that's a triangle from a, a ladder or some other shape that isn't round. So this might give us um, an almost natural signal, which again, we would catch in our searches for exoplanets. And with enough detailed uh, look at the data, we might find some unusual things like this. And lastly, how about a Cepheid variable star, right? Suppose you're an advanced technology and you could build something like huh, an orbital neutrino factory and you can fly it out around the nearest Cepheid variable to you. What about the star expands and gets brighter, it contracts and gets dimmer, and then it expands again with a regular period. Suppose you could take this energy source and as the star is contracted and thinking about expanding, you zap it and you cause the Cepheid to expand prematurely. 
Now you've made essentially a Morse code, a short period and a long period. And that Morse code signal can be seen all the way to the Virgo cluster of galaxies. It's a very, very bright source. So this is something also that you might find in um, routine surveys looking for Cepheid variables. Excuse me, I forgot to turn my phone off. Um, so these are just some examples. Now, what about obviously engineered signals? Well, if you're talking about electromagnetic radiation, uh, we can think about the radio dial and finding signals that are highly frequency compressed at only one channel on the radio dial. And in the optical, we can look for very, very short, bright nanosecond pulses in time. Both of these are things that we don't think nature can do, but we can do in the lab very easily. And lastly, we can also look for monochromatic laser emission from something that might be someone else's light sail accelerating spacecraft to interstellar uh, distances. So the, the consequences of these different types of signals are that for the almost natural signals, you just do any kind of astronomy you can think of, as much of it as you possibly can. And for the obviously engineered signals, because these are things that nature doesn't do, it means that we have to build dedicated telescopes to go looking for them. So here's a brief look at SETI within NASA from 1975 to 1993 after congressional termination. So um, workshops, working groups on finding exoplanets in those workshops. So this is where the whole um, field of exoplanet detection got started. Um, a tome called SP419, we got a golden fleece from Proxmire. We launched a 10-year project called um, HRMS, uh, High Resolution Microwave Survey, or Her Majesty's <laughs> Microwave Survey, Her Royal Majesty's Survey. Um, starting October 12, 1992, it was terminated by Senator, um, um, by Senator uh, in um, one year later, Senator Bryan. And then at the SETI Institute, we began Project Phoenix, which we considered rising from the ashes of congressional termination, a 10-year project to do much of what the NASA project would have done, but funded privately. So as we were in this process, at the turn of the century, we sat down and said, okay, what do we wanna do for the next 20 years? And the answer was, it still made sense to look for signals but we should expand the wavelength coverage and get into the optical and the infrared, which we've done. We should build a dedicated telescope so that we can observe 24 seven, as opposed to just being on the sky 10 or 15% of the time by using the astronomer's telescopes. And we needed to develop a means for looking at all the sky all the time to be able to have sensitivity to transient signals. And that's where we are today. That's what we're pioneering today. So this is the telescope that we built called the Allen Telescope Array. It's in Northern California near Mount Lassen, 42 dishes, each six meters apart. And they operate uh, as the equivalent of a large single dish. And we have done the astronomy community a big service in, in prototyping and, and building this because we have shown that this works it couldn't have worked 10 years ago because we just didn't have enough computing. Now it does, and in the future, large radio telescopes will be built this way. So for us, silicon is as important as aluminum and steel to combine all of the signals from this telescope together. And here is a nice clip. It's designed for SETI as well as radio astronomy. It has uniquely wide band receivers. It um, has a very large field of view because the telescope is small for a radio telescope. And it has good resolution, spatial resolution, because the telescopes are spread out over a 300 meter baseline. And we get to use it 24 seven, except right now where it's being furbished and its feeds 
and receivers are being updated. So let me show you what this kind of telescope can do. So there's the Andromeda galaxy for scale. Here's the, the moon at half a degree. And until recently, our most powerful radio telescope was the Arecibo telescope at 300 meters across. Um, but its field of view is tiny. And even when you make a focal plane array of multiple receivers, it's small compared to the kind of field of view you have with these small telescopes. So they are ideal survey instruments with the field of view of two and a half degrees at one gigahertz, right? Um, you can essentially use a correlator to make an image. So you can, this in particular, 1250 pixels in 1024 different frequency resolution channels. And there's another thing you can do with an interferometer is that you can um, form up multiple beams, phased up beams. So the beam resolution, the beam size is set by the largest baseline among all your antennas. You can look at multiple targets at once and you can even put the output of the telescopes together in a way that nulls particular directions on the sky. This is an opportunity to perhaps get rid of satellite interference if you have a very good catalog of satellites that will be coming into your field of view and you can track them and remove them before they get into the data. So um, we started with uh, a, a survey of what we called HABCAT targets. Maggie Turnbull helped make us that target of sun-like stars. Then once Kepler began to produce results, we used known exoplanets as our targets. And now before we shut down for um, upgrades, we are doing a 20,000 um, red dwarf survey because um, we know that now that every star has a planet. So you can see um, our concentration on the Kepler field. That was the known exoplanets for a while. And then you can see a space where we have no uh, observations and that's the geosynchronous belt because the transmitters coming from the satellites in that part of the sky are just so strong that they shut down our receivers. All right, and so that's the SETI Institute. But right now the 900 pound gorilla in the field of SETI is breakthrough listen thanks to um, a commitment of $100 million from Yuri Milner over 10 years. And they are building exquisite back-end signal processing instruments for existing telescopes, which they rent for 10 or 15% of the time. So this is the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia. Here's the Parkes Telescope in New South Wales, Australia. Um, here is the... Uh, Automated Planet Finder Telescope, an optical telescope at Lick Observatory in San Jose. And they will be putting instrumentation on the new Chinese telescope FAST, on the Meerkat telescopes in South Africa, which are a precursor to the Square Kilometer Array, and to the Venerable Jodrell Bank Telescope in the UK um, and the Maryland Merlin um, Array. So there's more SETI, um, no, sadly not on Arecibo anymore, but LOFAR uh, in um, the Netherlands in, and a LOFAR station in the UK and a LOFAR station in Sweden are looking for low frequency transients. There's a group in Italy called SETI Italia. Um, the NASA project was intended to have a sky survey component as well as a targeted search component. We could bring forward the targeted search, but the, the uh, sky survey required the telescopes of JPL Deep Space Network, and we lost access to that when the NASA program was terminated. But JPL actually has moved one of those telescopes outside the fence at Goldstone and partnered with local school district to form the Goldstone Apple Valley Research Telescope. And students there are conducting a sky survey as JPL would have as part of HRMS. Oops, I'm sorry, I didn't 
there. And um, occasionally there are these calls from Japan to get a whole bunch of different telescopes with different modalities looking at the same targets at the same time. And a new project that we're starting at the SETI Institute, which has me really excited, the uh, PI is Anders Simeon and the very large array in Socorro, New Mexico, which is 27, 25 meter dishes, is the most productive radio telescope on the planet. And Andrew and his team have figured out a way to um, make a copy of the voltages coming out of each of those telescopes and put them into a new signal processing unit that can look for engineered signals at the same time the radio astronomers are using their normal correlator to um, observe the sky. So it's a commensal project that we're really excited about. And optical SETI, well, Harvard uh, students built this um, optical SETI observatory at, um, in Harvard, Massachusetts, and they scanned the sky, 80% of the sky you can see from there, um, half a dozen times looking for um, optical signals. The Keck telescopes, which are used to find exoplanets, all of those data are reprocessed looking for laser signals. There's a, an amateur optical SETI observatory in, um, excuse me, oh, in uh, Bogota. And there is archival SETI that can be done. So the WISE spacecraft observed the entire sky in the infrared and those data have been searched looking for Kardashev type two civilizations, a civilization capable of manipulating all the um, energy that its star puts out, and our Kardashev three civilization, which is on steroids and manipulates all the energy that its galaxy produces. And new optical SETI projects are coming on the air as we speak, Veritas, which is a Sharenkov detection set of four telescopes looking for high energy cosmic rays. At their foci, they have a, um, a focal plane array of photodiodes. And so we've written new software so that instead of looking for what the astronomers are looking for, which is long trails across those photodiodes, for air showers, we're looking for a single pixel event, but it's the same pixel on the sky that happens simultaneously in all four antennas. And so there's a lot of archival data that's being gone through with this new software. And there's something like 30 hours a year of dedicated SETI observing. Shelley Wright, who you can see here through this Fresnel zone is leading, the Fresnel lens, is leading a project down at UC San Diego called Panoceti uh, by building a kind of Buckminster Fuller dome and filling each of those dome elements with one of these Fresnel, zone, uh, Fresnel lenses. You can focus a large area of the sky onto very small, very sensitive photo detectors. And so um, you can see something like 10,000 square degrees of the sky at any one time from a site. And of course you need to build two of these because you're looking for transient signals and the best way to have confidence that what you're seeing is something actually coming from the sky as opposed to something that um, is in your instrumentation or just a cosmic ray um, is to have co-observing and so that project's ongoing. And then at the SETI Institute, we're building something called Laser SETI. It doesn't use telescopes. It uses optical grade cameras, very wide field cameras and gratings with fast readout. And we can place eight of these cameras at a site and have multiple sites around the globe. And the hope is that um, we will be looking at all the sky all the time before too long. So the first setup is at um, an observatory in Sonoma and the second is on its way right now to Haleakala. So it's in the middle of the ocean on a boat. And now that COVID restrictions are backing down, we can install that at Haleakala. And as I said, eventually 12 or 15 
of these observatories will cover all the sky all the time, looking for very short pulses. So the future, well, JWST is, we hope, going to finally launch. And that will have the ability to look at a few nearby exoplanets and perhaps be able to tell us something about the chemical composition of their atmospheres. Um, followed by what used to be called W first is now the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope. And then depending on the, um, excuse me, decadal review. Okay, depending, well, that wants to move along by itself. Depending on the decadal review, um, we may have Habax or Louvoir and in, um, from ESA, the aerial space telescopes. And these are really of a scale that will allow us to do serious searches for biosignatures um, around a number of exoplanets. And here's a funny telescope. It looks more like a radio interferometer than an optical telescope. And it's being studied by Jeff Kuhn and his team and, um, in Hawaii. Uh, the claim is that for the Proxima B system, if you can in fact follow um, enough light curves, hundreds of light curves, you could in fact um, uh, back out essentially a, um, opacity map of any exoplanets that might be there and actually have some ability to distinguish between oceans and continents. So beyond that, the future for SETI and optical SETI, um, the TMT, the 30 meter telescope, the giant Magellan telescope, the European extremely large telescope at 40 meters back down from the OWL overwhelmingly large 100 meter telescopes. And we need to figure out a way to put um, optical SETI instrumentation on these telescopes in a commensal manner. Large synoptic sky <coughs> survey telescope, which is gonna give us a picture of the sky every three days. Um, we will also be looking at that data for SETI, optical SETI transients. Laser SETI, Pano SETI, we already talked about those. Um, Veritas, and then FAST in the radio, um, FAST in China, and the Square Kilometer Array in Meerkat in South Africa, the next generation VLA, if the decadal review blesses it, and if we can get that um, Exo Life Finder telescope that I showed you from Hawaii, if we can make that work, then we could phase up similar instrumentations in an 80 meter class thing called Colossus. And this would actually enable you to see the heat signatures of cities should they exist on nearby exoplanets. So the day after tomorrow, we have Meerkat now, the square kilometer um, will allow us to have maybe 250 phased up beams at the same time. So 250 different targets probing millions of stars. Um, this will give us enough sensitivity for, so that for the first time we have an opportunity to be able to go looking for the kind of leakage radiation that 21st century Earth produces. Um, and some things never change. This is the flag of Earth and everyone still flies it whenever they're observing. This was designed by a, an Iowa farmer called James Kedell. He tried to get NASA to fly this flag um, when they landed on the moon rather than the flag of the United States because he thought that this was a flag with the sun, the earth and the moon for all humankind and not just the US you notice what flag got planted on the moon. And we still plan for success. So everywhere we observe, there is indeed champagne on ice. Interference is getting worse and worse. And this is not only true in the radio, which is what you see here, but in the optical with um, things like 65,000 satellites as a part, part of Starlink 
and other satellite systems that are going to make the night sky quite bright. So the technologies for the search have changed from 1992 where our hardware was full custom. In fact, we had to make our own chips because nothing could do Fourier transforms fast enough. Now through um, F machines based on FPGAs and CPUs and now GPU backends. So our backend technology has improved enormously and the question is, how much SETI have we done in 50 years? Well, I looked at the nine dimensional phase space that you need to observe to perhaps find an electromagnetic signal. And I set that volume equal to the Earth's oceans and calculated that at SETI, at 50, we had looked at one glass of water out of the oceans. Now at 60, it's more like a small hot tub, right? So it's improving and it will improve faster and faster. Um, and this is, this is actually more than Moore's law because there are parallel improvements in the various components because we now have dedicated telescopes and more telescopes and more wavelengths um, and more time on the sky via commensal opportunities and of course improved algorithms and future improvements that we're looking towards with machine learning. So finally, life beyond Earth, well, we can export it. We're talking about going back to the moon, to Mars, to the asteroids, breakthrough Starshot, 100 year Starship study, and Icarus are all thinking about how we get to the nearest star systems. And the reason that I like working on SETI, the reason that I like talking to groups such as yourselves um, is because I think that the process of giving this talk is essentially holding up a mirror to you, to all of us on this planet and saying, look, see in that mirror, we're all the same when compared to something else that may have evolved on a different planet around a different star. And I think that the process of trivializing the differences among humans is something that we really need to take seriously. We have all of these challenges in our future, and these challenges do not respect national boundaries. And we are going to have to figure out solutions for these challenges in a global and cooperative manner. So anything that helps us see ourselves as earthlings rather than Russians or Chinese or Europeans or British or you, you know, Americans, but gives us this much greater cosmic perspective, I think is very, very valuable. And so the last word goes to Caleb Scharf, who's the chairman of the astrobiology department at Columbia University. And Caleb reminds us that on a finite world, and here is the Earth rise image of our finite world. A cosmic perspective isn't a luxury, but it's an absolute necessity. And so that's what I wanted to say tonight. And thank you so much for listening. And if you tolerate uh, one more minute, I'd like to give you a homework assignment, which is that when you leave and get back to your homes and offices and all of your devices, which have personal profiles on them. It would be wonderful if the first thing that you said about yourself was that you're an earthling and then start to act like it. I think astronomers can do that very well. Thank you. Thank you, Jill, that was fabulous. I, I, I assume people are all clapping out there in the digital world. Um, yeah, there, we're getting comments on Zoom and there, I just, I, I can't entertain all the questions on our live stream on YouTube, but I'm just gonna ask a couple. Um, and I think it's, uh, well, I won't say the name of the people, they might wanna be anonymous. One question from the YouTubers are, can we build a telescope on the moon to con continue SETI from there? We can, and that has been talked about for a long time now. Um, the, um, 
the troublesome thing is that yes, at the moon, it's, it's the only place that doesn't, the lunar far side is the only place that doesn't see the earth in its sky and the earth with all its orbital satellites and all its interference. So that's good. But we're now talking about building a gateway system directly over the lunar far side. And so we are going to begin to pollute um, the lunar space. The only thing is we're conscious of it and perhaps we can be thoughtful enough um, and proactive enough so that we manage to protect all of the spectrum at least some of the time. So we can't look at all of it all the time, but maybe we can frequency share and um, have parts of the spectrum free at any one time. So another question from YouTube is, is a really interesting one. Should SETI add post LIGO design gravitational wave detectors in case electromagnetic modulation goes the way of smoke signals for communication? Yes, that is a, certainly a, an information bearing uh, signal potentially. Right now, I think it's just beyond our um, budget. You're gonna have to build something very massive in order to be sensitive to this strain of signal. Um, we're, we haven't even begun to get up the nerve to think about how to do that. But if somebody would like to start a working group um, and like Icarus or some of these other projects, think about how you might do that, then that would be great because gravitational waves get not, not a lot gets in their way, right? And just as a point of personal privilege, I'm gonna ask a question, which is um, in the Drake equation, one of, of the elements is how long does a civilization last um, that has the technological ability to communicate? And I'm just wondering if you have any feelings um, given the earth's current climate crisis, what is your feeling about that? And, and if other civilizations have solved the problem? Well, Linda, I'm gonna duck that question a little bit because you're talking about the term L in the Drake equation, which is the longevity, not necessarily of the civilization, but of the technology that's doing the transmitting. And we have many examples on this planet where the technology has outlived the civilization. We make glass today the same way that the Romans made it 2000 years ago and they're long gone. So um, that longevity term needs to be understood as it's how long the actual transmission of information continues. And it might be longer than the lifetime of the, the creation civilization. I mean, we have um, Legios satellites around earth that'll be up there for millions of years more. Great point. Well, I think I'm, we'll bring a close to the live stream on YouTube. And I wanna thank everybody on YouTube for joining us. Please remember this is a free broadcast, but we would really deeply appreciate a donation to the Astronomical Society of the Pacific so that we can bring you more really wonderful and inspiring broadcasts like this one. And it supports all of our education programs. So thank you very much, those of you on YouTube, those of you on Zoom, stick around. We're gonna um, get an opportunity to ask questions of Jill. Thanks. Okay. Bye YouTubers. <laughs> and now, Brian, are we able to open it up to, let's see.